And there we go. Super. Welcome everybody to the fifth and final online teaching Tuesday drop-in gathering. Really, really happy to have people with us today. Um, we are never really talking about tools, but rather about pedagogy because everybody, we have folks here from K-12, from colleges, from universities, from workplace learning spaces. Everybody has their own kind of institutional tools that folks want you to work with or that your institution has decided to invest money in and probably people whose job it is to help you with the how, but we want to talk about the big picture of thinking with those tools. How do you design meaningful learning experiences in online spaces? And today, design is that keyword. I guess there it says create. So today we're moving from just create to specifically maybe starting with a conversation around design. Um, all of our conversations at OTT20 are focused on being simple, equitable, and engaging. That's really the framework that we're using, kind of a little mantra to keep in your mind of here's how I go ahead and ask myself if I'm going to be doing something that makes sense. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, you can go to k12.olaya.ca. And why don't we introduce our guest, Sunday? Please take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sundi, pronounced Sun plus D. And I am Assistant Director for Digital Learning at Davidson College in Davidson, North Carolina. I am not currently there. I'm currently in Charlotte, North Carolina, about 20 minutes away. So no commute for the past couple months, which has been nice. Um, it's a small liberal arts school, but I've also taught or I've also worked at and taught at um, larger public schools as well. So I've ha I have a wealth of experience to draw from. Nice to be here. Great to have you. And her partner in crime and also work. Uh, I'm Daniel Linz uh, on the Twitters and in real life as well. Um, in the flesh, not that Twitter isn't real. It feels surreal most of the time nowadays, but anywho. Uh, this slide tells you all the things you kind of need to know about me, I guess, except that yes, uh, Sunday's out there. so. We are in Charlotte together, or uh, we are, I like to uh, refer to Charlotte as the occupied territories of the Sugari and Catawba nations. Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm an instructional designer. Um, I say random things in random orders. So that's, that's how I roll. That's Daniel, that's what he's bringing to the table. And uh, if, if you didn't pick it up, uh, Matt, our, our next guest, uh, I believe, does not have his partner joining him for this, but I feel kind of bad about that. But here you go, Matt. You, you got to work on your own today. So there you go. Uh, yeah, I'm sure glad to join in. I'm sure she knows a lot more than I do about a lot of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. My name is Matt Crossland, uh, currently a learning innovation researcher at the University of Texas Arlington, the Link Research Lab there. Uh, before that, I was an instructional designer there for a while, and also before that, eighth grade science teacher. So I'm always glad to talk K-12 with people because I've done that a little bit as well. And I also teach a few classes online from time to time at the University of Texas at Rio Grande Valley, usually in instructional design as well or something like that. And I'm also a blogger at edgegeekjournal.com, which is where I usually tend to make a lot of people mad with whatever I post. And so that's not me. We all have our colleagues, Matt. Um, so if anybody would like to just show up today to have a nice fight with Matt, he's, he's here, he's ready. Um, but we can also have productive conversations. It's entirely up to you. Uh, we'll turn it back to Dave and he can see what's popping up in the either chat or Q&A. Um, hmm. So, I mean, I do, I, I also only came here to fight with Matt. So that's, um, that's really, that's par for the course. So first question that came up, it's a nice softball to start, um, and it's what have you seen in the last, let's call it eight weeks, I don't know why I picked that number at random, uh, that's been cool or that you're surprised. What innovative thing have you seen happen in the last eight weeks that sort of comes to your mind, you're like, holy, I never thought of that before, or, that's been really cool, or that's an interesting piece of design. Uh, let's start with the D-man. Uh, you're on the spot now, buddy. I sure am. I, well, when you said this, I thought of cold open. Um, oh, yeah, for sure. Um, that's more than eight weeks out, though. Sadly, we are on hiatus. So uh, our last episode was, uh, or last volume was last week. Um, we got a write-up on in Ed Surge, and we got mentioned in a whole bunch of weird places. Basically, it's uh, 
a virtual open mic night where the different students uh, from our college, it's a closed event, so it's not like a big public open thing that anyone can jump into. It's meant as a, it ended up turning into like art therapy basically, um, but it was originally intended for uh, students who would show uh, graduating seniors who would, would, would have had art shows but did not. So we gave them a space, albeit just a Zoom room, but I think the way that we uh, designed the interaction and stuff like that made everyone feel really comfortable and it was ultimately very safe as well. Um, so yeah, that was that was pretty cool. Everyone's still talking about it. The president of our college knows my name now for sure. I think she might have <laughs> known it before, but she definitely knows now. Um, and she's been really great and supportive and uh, she was actually supposed to speak a couple times, but for some reason got pulled into other directions. I can't imagine why. She probably has nothing on her plate right now. But anywho. How about yeah, you, Matt? So we'll go with Matt? I'm trying to take a what's the coolest thing I've seen online recently. I think it's just that uh, we're still moving forward. <laughs> we're still <laughs> making it. I mean, we're still, we're still here talking and the, the internet lived uh, through the massive move online. I mean, it was very hard for a lot of people and we left a lot of people behind. Uh, so obviously there's a lot of work to be done. Um, but you know, the, the, the thing is, is that uh, I saw just individual conversations with different faculty as they were trying to move online were some of the cool things I, I saw, you know, we, we, you know, uh, people tend to make fun of boomers or older people, but some, the interesting thing is there was people that were, you know, well into their 60s or 70s that I was talking to and they just kind of, it just they clicked and they got it. I was like, oh yeah, I just need to stop doing these tests and stop doing these lectures and just make this more interactive and make this, you know, reach out to my students and care about them, right? That's what I gotta do. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, that's good. So whenever anyone of any age starts saying, oh, this, this, you know, I don't like this, or I have to do my lecture or that thing as, you know, I don't, it, it's cool that it's, it, it's, it's just this mindset thing. And, and when you see those people that get it, especially the care side and the student centered side, that's some of the coolest things that I see is, is, is really that. That's very cool. How about you, Sunday? Did he steal yours? So I got the longest time to think about it. So can I share two things? Yeah, yes, you can. Because now I can't decide which one. <laughs> so Matt just made me realize. So yes, the attitudes of a lot of instructors and how they just shifted was one of the coolest things to see. And so I'm going to speak about two specific ones. One, um, an economics professor who was doing super simple, like synchronous Zoom lectures with his class, but he was so communicative to them about how much he cared that his class was just so super engaged and stayed engaged for the rest of the semester, which is amazing. He didn't do any crazy innovative things. It was very straightforward. But uh, I was in his class one time and all of his students changed their name to Tom. So <laughs> in Zoom, it was all Tom. He's like, oh, what did you all do there? And it was just like <laughs> such a great example of just, you know, a, a nice atmosphere um, within a class. And so that was one cool thing. The other one was a, um, an intro lab. So, you know, could be something K-12 related as well um, for a bio. And, you know, a lot of folks kind of freaked out about the lab thing, right? Like, we can't do this in this mm. online space. We're going to have to, like, cut all our content. Mm. And she was like, what is the main thing we do in lab for this class? Because it was an intro level. And she said, oh, it's coming up with a hypothesis. And so that's all I need my students to do. And so she found this uh, great open online database with bird sounds. Oh, cool. And students had to... Um, find different bird sounds and come up with a hypothesis about why they were similar or dissimilar. And then they sent her the information and she analyzed it and gave it back to them to kind of uh, make a report and um, make sense of it. So it was a really nice back and forth and just her creative thinking, right? That's really cool. Bonnie. I love those specific examples. Um, I was also thinking about the ways in which we're seeing new people come out with, with an interest in online that we've been, I've been working in, we've, a lot of, most of us have been working in online for years, but it's interesting that the value proposition of online has never quite made it out past a certain group and suddenly 
everyone's got to try it. Um, the big thing that I'm seeing is I'm, I'm starting to think about it in terms of literacies and how we build um, li literacies for things that, you know, are, are going to be new program wide, right? I work in a program where students take 10 courses at once. And so the students who are working with me next year are going to be working with nine other faculty, probably at least six or seven of whom have never taught online. And so how do we build kind of literacies across our program for making sense of this? And it's, it's interesting, right? I am um, normally just kind of a faculty member without responsibility for that program view of what happens. But I think there is a, a moment where we might be able to draw all of us into more shared conversations than have been there before about what happens at the program level, what happens at the teaching level, and I want to throw this back to design, what happens at the design level, and yeah, maybe so think about that. I, I just want to give one example before we start the design question, because I think that's an important one. I think it's one that's, that's mostly misunderstood or often misunderstood. Um, I want to tell the story about Don, uh, my environmental engineering prof who was in the course last week. Don wrote this blog post on Thursday where he was writing through this thing he was trying to explain to students that he always has to explain them every year. And he got about four sentences in and he goes, see, you don't understand it either. And then he goes, I kind of feel when I think about this that I just spent the last like 20 years just covering the material. Like I felt like I needed to do it. And now I'm thinking about it and I'm like, I don't really think I'm helping students doing that. I think I'd be way better off to take that one concept I was talking about above and do this practical thing they could do in their house and this practical thing they could do in their house and this practical thing they could do in their house and really get them into it so that they understand what it really means to understand some engineering concept I don't get. Um, but it was those, it's those realizations to me, it's that sort of small change stuff that I've seen every single week in teaching the course I've been teaching that's really blown me away it's those those moments where people are like, huh, I'm being it's smart people, like smart people who care about their students, who who care about the process, who are like, wait a minute, I don't need to have ever done this this way. And that's been for me, like it's that kind of change that has been blowing me away. It really leaves me kind of hopeful uh, with all the other terrible things going on in terms of how the education system is moving. Certainly, in my, I, I end up being hopeful in the process. But to go back to the comment that Bonnie made, so we've got, like I say, we've got three people who are, uh, who self-identify, I would say, as designers, to say that's fair. Yeah, and Bonnie, I don't think you would necessarily, but you, yeah, exactly. So for you guys, when people say a designer in the way that you do it, I won't even, I won't even put an adjective on the front, I'll let you guys do that. But I mean, we'll start with Sunday. What does it mean to you? What does that work mean? What is it? I won't even put a qualifier on it. You shape it for me. Yes. So any instructional designer, I think designers have it better. But instruct when you put instructional design, it like confuses people to hell. So Daniel and I have been like trying to, and then both of us are this thing. And we're trying to explain it to so many people. And so I constantly try to explain it and I still don't get it across. So I don't know if if I can do that, but you know, I see it as working with people and materials to try to figure out how things work together, right? Like what is it gonna, what are we gonna create and how can we create something that has flexibility and accessibility and these things that are gonna make it work like kind of like a living kind of being, right? Um, so it's not a thing where you just sit down and you, you have it designed. It's a constantly moving thing. And it has to do with people and content and technology, all sorts of things. But again, people are the most important thing in this um, design work. And for you, Matt, what does it mean to design learning in that way? What does that look like for you? Just kind of twisting the question just a little. That, that is a good question um, and something that has been the subject of very contentious arguments for decades now, it seems like, um, and I, I very foolishly get into some of those when I shouldn't. 
Um, I think, Dave, you know, as you said earlier and what everyone else has shared here uh, uh, as well, uh, those aha moments where people realize, oh, I didn't have to do it this way for so many decades. I think it's somehow figuring out a way to ask the questions to get people to that point uh, in less than 20 years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> theoretically, <laughs> theoretically, you know, within six months or two weeks or whatever time frame you're given to design a course. Um, unfortunately, it seems like you kind of have to teach an online course and cause a lot of problems with, with your students before people had that light bulb moment. And we're trying to avoid that because, um, you know, that's, that's very harmful to the students. But yeah, asking those questions, sometimes getting into the very uh, difficult, uh, critical questions that aren't just, uh, you know, what blog should I pick? Or what tool should I pick? Should it be a blog? Should it be a discussion board? Something like that. But those, those deeper questions of design, but also equality issues and, you know, as far as what society brings in as well, you know, we've, we've kind of had that brought to light with the, the coronavirus panic, panic, but that's always been this big question about social, cultural differences and power imbalances and those kind of things as well that uh, we don't seem to always uh, get um, as much discussion out there. There are, like in the critical pedagogy in different realms, there are those discussions, but they very rarely seem to get outside of that into the larger discussion of education as far as are we asking these questions. So, um, so that, that is kind of what I like to design is asking those questions, uh, trying to get to those harder things to, to dig into why they're doing these things and, you know, why does the instructor have to be the center of things and can we change that to some degree. So Daniel, oh. I'll ask the question in a third way to you. Well, how does that process start? So w if you're designing something, what's the start of the design process? So if somebody wants to do it, and if somebody in the, in the room is thinking, okay, so I wanna try, like wh what, is, what is the first step in that process? It's all about the people. I go back to what Sandy said. I mean, it's, um, and actually I've been, um, I could have, when, I, when you asked about a cool thing, um, recently about design or whatever, something else that um, I've been trying to do. I haven't had as much uh, uptake the last few weeks, but I'm calling it a digital makeover. So kind of like, a, you know, like a clear eye, how they go in and change people's, like they try to change their attitude. They try to make them more positive. They try to make them more, whatever the thing is that that person doesn't necessarily have. Um, they fix up their house. They try to talk to them about their past. So with the digital makeover, it's kind of similar, you know, because we all get these boxes and we learn how to use the box however the whatever someone shows us a couple things and then we just use the box the same way but a lot of people don't necessarily go oh what is the default of this machine and what how is my body and my relation to this thing how will that change they're more just like okay i click f2 to do this thing so this is where like the how to of tools often creates um more friction in our designing than um than not because it, it, we, we are looked at when, when instructional designers or technologists, people don't know the difference between those names. Sometimes they don't, there is no difference depending on where you are, right? So um, yeah, I say it always starts with the people. And uh, if, if again, if they're eager and they're like, yeah, I wanna do this thing, then the first thing I, I always need to do is kind of figure, try to meet them where they are, uh, whether that's the students or the, the prof or the staff member, whoever, uh, try to meet them where they are, figure out what they're, what skill set they have to bring to, to whatever the thing is going to be eventually. And that's where we start. We say, okay. And then we backward design. I usually would backward design that thing and say, okay, in six months, you want to have these things. So that means in the first, in the, you know, a month from then you'll need this and we'll build towards that thing kind of gradually. Cool. Long, long answer, but. Oh, no, that's good. That's good. That's really good. I'd love to riff on what Melanie said in the chat room here, if I could. Um, so in the midst of this conversation, Melanie uh, said, so that means we can't design a course completely until we know our students. Um, and I think it's a really great comment. I, um, those of you who know me will know that I totally agree with that. Um, and I think that to some degree, you always have to kind of adapt to the students, but I would suggest that you can design that adaptation into the process. And to some degree, we always end up designing some adaptation into the process so that we can adapt to our students and stuff. So I wonder if you guys would be willing to speak. Maybe we'll start with Bonnie because I didn't give her a design question. How do you, I, you already admitted you weren't a designer, so I just, I don't wanna. I'm not I, a designer, but I do design. And I think true. 
I, I think it actually, I may design badly, so actually, <laughs> <laughs> I've really invited these three folks here today to help me <laughs> with my class. Um, but, but in truth, teachers do end up designing, right? And even if um, what your design is, is we're going to read this and do this test, that is a form of design. It may not be the one that I would wish for. Um, but what I end up doing, Daniel mentioned backwards design. And my really basic understanding of that is it means kind of start with the, for me, the experience I want my students to have, and then kind of work back from that to the cognitive elements, the social elements, how are we going to get there? How am I building little learning ramps for my students to get to those places? Um, and how do I create activities so that they can get there? Um, and so, yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm doing. And, and that decentering of myself to try to create ways of putting them together in new ways. That's one of the things that I really like about digital technology. The reason I got excited about it when I started using it to teach years and years ago was because it allowed me to do some things that I couldn't actually do in the face-to-face -face class, right? So I, I have all, I've taught blended classes on purpose since 2005. Any class I've been given to teach, I've always added a digital element, even if it wasn't built in by the institution, because I like some of the things that it lets me do but it means I need to keep learning about what those things are. And so how do you design for students who aren't there, who you haven't met yet? How do you make that adaptation? How do you allow room? How does that look? Back I, think, to Melanie's question. I think that's the truth for me. Any time that I'm teaching, whether it's online or not. Um, so, I'm always designing because we like in my institution, we have to put the syllabi in very early in the course, right? I may be, I actually do tend to reissue my syllabi multiple times through the year, but I open my course with a high, here's the beginning of our conversation. Um, and then I'm trying to figure out who my students are. One of the things that I usually do in my on um, my face to face classes um, is I try to use that first class to figure out who they are. So if I'm teaching digital technologies, I have this kind of little slide deck of survey questions um, that I will actually ask people. But I, if I can, if if we are face to face, and if everyone in the room has the physical mobility to do so, I will ask people to kind of stand up and make a, a long line or clump. And then I'll ask different questions where they can self-select their answers um, around practices, things that they do related to the digital, feelings that they may have, partly so that I can get a sense of the range of opinions in the room and the range of practices in the room, partly so that uh, they can get a sense of who their compatriots and like-minded folks are and maybe who the folks that may have different kinds of practices from them are. Um, I try to switch up the questions so that it's not everybody is always getting kind of reinforced for doing X or Y. Um, and it also allows them to see that it's totally okay to come into this class. Like you are still welcome if you don't know X or don't do X or don't ever want to do X. And it gives me a chance to make that really clear. And it also gives me a chance to teach a few things while they're doing it because some of them will be like, do you know how to do control? What does control F do? Well, I find out that 40, 50% of them don't know. And then I'm like, handy tip, you're going to want to control F all our readings so you can figure out the key points and not have to, you know, read the whole thing necessarily. Um, but that, that's something that I do to give me a sense of who's in the room. This year, I'm going to figure out how to do that in an online space. Um, and it probably means using something like a Mentimeter tool or whatever, but I want to still ask those questions and get a sense of what people are bringing to the class. So we uh, all managed to answer this question in the chat room. So I think we could just keep on going from there. I have a question that, that isn't actually exactly in the chat room, but it has come up every week and we have not managed to do a really good job of answering that question. And that's the question of accessibility. So we, I, I had a faculty member today write and say, um, you're too small whenever you do the presentation. I can't lip read when you're talking. And so is there any way we can set up so that you can give me some kind of voice to text or something that's going to allow me to 
be able to follow along. One of the things that's happened with us moving online is a whole bunch of people who knew that they were going to struggle working in an online environment for any number of reasons are now being forced to do that anyway. And also we don't have the hands-on ability to provide some of the face-to-face -face supports that we were giving to people before. So we, we have a number of challenges and a lot of this is about design. So for you guys, what kinds of ways do you try to build for accessibility whenever you guys are, are doing this kind of design? What advice do you have for people? Uh, advice that people can get done. Like what are the things that you would say that always do this whenever you're doing stuff? We'll start with you, Matt. Oh, um, accessibility, wow, it's a big topic. Um, let's see. I mean, a lot of that comes down to, you know, making sure that your videos have, uh, have the captionings, making sure that your images have alt text and that kind of thing. I mean, that's, that's just, a, you know, making sure the pages are designed well. A lot of that stuff is just kind of detailed work that you, you kind of have to just, yeah, you have to you have to get it done. You can't just um, a lot of faculty like to have this 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 uh, attitude towards it of well I'll just get to it when someone complains about it. But you really it's something that I mean once that happens usually it's a little bit too late. There's already probably been some damage done for one thing. Uh, so it's, it's one of those things that you have to plan for from the beginning. But I I like to look at tools um, and try to remember who did this. But the Ally tool uh, basically to look at each of your web pages and check it for accessibility. Um, cool. Um, you know, it's, it's one of them, one of them is just a browser plugin. You, you install it on your browser and it checks each page as you go along, gives you suggestions for how to make your web, uh, your website accessible. You know, and, and there's a lot of debate now about the whole synchronous versus asynchronous, you know, whether we're going to meet face to face with the students or we're going to do it, uh, they can do it on their own time at different times. And, you know, I, I think the thing to realize is that the more, the more of those elements you have where students have to be in the same time, in the same place, is going to decrease the accessibility for your learners, especially with the coronavirus lockdown. And a lot of people are saying, well, they signed up for this course at Monday, Wednesday, Friday at, at 9 a.m. So, of course, they can always be here Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 a.m. Well, maybe so for some of them, but for a lot of them, their schedules changed. They might have lost work. They might have had to take on extra work or something like that or extra duties with taking care of their kids at home or something. So, you know, we don't even have the, that, you know, we, we don't have that uh, assurance really that their schedules stay the same because of the coronavirus and it's probably changing. So I think one of the big things for accessibility is looking at, my, looking at the courses and seeing how we can decrease the number of these face-to-face -face sessions that are required for them to go to uh, and I say that as we're in a face-to-face -face session. <laughs> so. Daniel? Um, I don't know the answer. This is one of the, when it comes to designing anything, accessibility is absolutely the hardest and most mm -hmm. chaotic or complex but, one. Because but I think that's a really important thing to say just off the top. Like, it is hard. I think yeah. sometimes people get the sense that they don't know and they're just missing out on an easy thing. But I think that's yeah. a really great point. No, it's really, yeah, and it's, it's um, you know, the, the affordances that we have with these different tools that we use, not everyone has the same affordances, right? And um, access is an issue, um, bandwidth is an issue. Um, and as Matt actually um, said earlier, I was amazed um, at the infrastructure and how things didn't just totally, the whole internet didn't break when all of a sudden, like everyone needed Zoom right now. That was just, or whatever video conferencing thing. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, I try, when I design stuff, I try my best to make people aware. Um, well, A, I try to stay current with what uh, accessibility standards are out there and different ways of making those things. Um, but uh, I, I try my best to make sure that whomever I'm designing with um, keeps that in mind as well and that they don't just kind of glaze over it. Sunday? Well, I think you all have hit on some key points. I guess I'll just add, sometimes we can do really simple things like clear organization, um, using text hierarchies like headings and subheadings and things like that. There's a checker you can use for Google Docs that like checks your document to see if it's good for screen readers. Just, I, I know it's not a simple 
there is no simple answer, but there are also tangible things that we can do, especially as instructors, in when we create something to start with accessibility instead of having to convert something to accessibility, right? Bonnie? For me, and I started teaching online before I learned very much about accessibility because I don't have a formal instructional design background, um, but slowly I've been picking up things I can do. And one of the big conceptual things that helped for me was the idea of um, something called universal design for learning. That as an instructor, when I was teaching in adult ed, uh, it was part of the content of the course I was teaching. And I was really embarrassed to be teaching a fully online course with no universal design for learning um, <laughs> Uh, uh, principles while teaching about universal design for learning so I started incorporating it and to me that the key things that it talks about are um, the idea of UDL or, or universal design for learning is that uh, rather than trying to figure out who my students are and what Dave needs and what Matt needs and what Sunday needs all of which will be different is UDL assumes that you're going to have diversity in the classroom in terms of learning needs, socioeconomic needs, physical needs, et cetera, to begin with. And then trying to at least offer multiple means of representing the information that you're giving out. So for instance, rather than giving my online students just a wall of text every week, I try to make sure that I've got like a, an image that maybe symbolizes one of the core ideas and maybe I've got a video um, rather than just readings so that I'm working with different kind of modalities, um, that there are multiple means of engagement. So rather than saying everybody do uh, in the courses that I teach, digital stuff, rather than saying everybody make a video, I'll say, okay, here's a rubric. I would like you to make a digital artifact. You can choose a video or an infographic or uh, even a hand-drawn sketch note if you don't feel, but it's gotta be visual right? Because visual is one of the pieces on the rubric. And I'd like you to work building your visual literacies and respond to this article with some kind of digital artifact, but you can choose a di what kind of digital artifact works for you. Um, and then I think there's multiple means of, I can't remember the third one, it's representation, engagement, and the assessment. Um, anyway, the idea that you are giving choice and building in um, options for people so that you're trying to hit a broad range of strengths um, rather than looking at, oh, this is the problem that Daniel has, let me accommodate him. And I, I thought that was important for, for me and for my teaching and I try to use it in face-to-face -face and online courses. I'll put a link in around it. I'm really enjoying the chat room today. We have two totally separate sessions running at the same time. It's really great. Um, I'm gonna bring us back to a very subtle question that Amanda asked earlier that I really, I kind of had to sit and ponder. So I'm gonna repost it here, just so we can all get a chance to read it as well as me read it out loud. Um, I too like to have my students answer questions at the beginning of the class in part so they can I get them to also get to know each other, feel less alone. I wonder how to ask questions publicly in online spaces. The joy of the face-to-face -face is that the answer disappears. Um, and I, it's a really nice kind of nuanced question. So how do you ask questions in ways that sort of give you some of that togetheriness without the risk of permanence that can sometimes happen whenever we're working together online? Bonnie would like to start. Teacher me, please teacher. Um, Lisa, you get an A. <laughs> <laughs> oh, grade me. No, don't, don't grade me. Um, one of the things I did respond just quickly to Amanda in there, online we're always being traced and tracked. And I think that's important for us to be considering with all the tools that we're using right now to begin with. So literally things don't disappear. However, in terms of the actual like identified, my, my name, my digital footprint is attached to what I do. One of the tool that I was talking about, um, Mentimeter, and some of the online polling tools that are similar like Kahoot or Quizlet are all ways that you can get the feel of a room without necessarily even seeing who gave what answer. So they will, you can put a question out, everyone goes kind of on their phone or device in real time, may answer the question, and then 
the, um, I think Mentimeter does a nicer job than Kahoot, but it will show you the answers in different ways that visually represent with a pie chart or a Wordle or whatever. So students can see what everyone's answers were, but they can't see what Sunday's answer was or Bonnie's answer was. And so there, that does seem to be kind of a low bar for engagement. It, it does tend to encourage students to engage in that sense. But Mentimeter's data policy isn't too bad, um, but they are all collecting data for sure. Yeah, not so much a public example for me, but uh, certainly one that we've had a lot of, well, I mean, I, I've been using for years, but we've had a lot of luck with it in, in the courses we've been, where we've been teaching faculty uh, who don't necessarily always like to expose their not knowing at the beginning of the course. But they get more comfortable as it goes along, but it's understandable in any situation. Uh, I, we use something that I sort of grandiosely called live slides, but all it is is a blank slide where people type text on it in the middle of like a collaborate session. And the nice thing about that is that you get kind of a window on the whole synchronous environment. It all pops up onto one slide, but you don't know who's writing what. So it has that level of anonymity, but it's still a togetherness and they all kind of pop up together and you get kind of a view of what's happening with everybody in a way that I would say is even has more chance for a revealing togetherness than a face to face classroom where you know, the 10 year old boy in the corner might be shy to talk. I may not want to say what they think out loud in that kind of environment. There's a controlled anonymity. So you're anonymous in the sense that I don't know which of the 30 people in the room has said it, but we know that it's nobody belong beyond that group of 30 who's involved in the discussion. So it still manages to create a kind of a group environment and create some of that sort of joy, that explosion of sort of thought but it was still maintaining the anonymity and allowing people to share in the midst of that. So I've, I've had a lot of luck with that over the years. Uh, Sandy. Yeah, I'm just thinking through this and kind of coming up with some ideas because it, there are different, I think both of your examples are really good ones and they're very specific to a type of engagement that you're doing, like you're you know answering in a short way or you're answering quickly together with a group of people. Mm. Could we also think about it in even a more in-depth discussion forum that like goes away, kind of like a Snapchat discussion forum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I haven't thought about that, but that is an interesting thing to try to think through. How do we do that in like maybe an asynchronous way that people can put more thought into it, but still have it disappear? So yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. given me some idea. That's cool. That's very cool. Or Daniel, we'll leave Matt for last this time. Um, I totally just got distracted because like a dozen people just walked by our front yard with no masks on or anything like that. And it kind of just- If you think that I've been teaching for 20 some years and did not notice the distracted person in the room, you're wrong, uh, buddy, Andrea, you're I wrong. Think, I think that's why you <laughs> called me out. Of course it is. Um, <laughs> no, I hadn't noticed Daniel, I apologize. Um, no, um, can Did I pass? You, yes, you can. Matt, go ahead. I pass it back. Um, <laughs> <no. laughs> uh, this is a hard question. You're talking about it going away. Um, that's, uh, that's, I mean, cause things do go away sometimes online, but not the things you want to go away. Um, <laughs> the things you wish would go away don't, uh, because that's, that's kind of when you go back to the, unfortunately, uh, people might throw stones at me, but that's when you go back to the LMS because it kind of gets locked in the LMS yeah. and then they delete that after a few years, whether you want to or not. Uh, which kind of goes back into a problem with the LMS is that it's all locked away in the LMS. And then how do students show uh, anyone else in the world that they learned something specific beyond just this diploma that says they learned it. Um, so that could be a good chance to discuss with your students uh, the, the, the pitfalls and the dangers of having your information out on the, the internet, the interwebs or whatever you call them. Um, and uh, talk through the issues of identity and safety and those kind of things. And then uh, see where your students are interested in going after that. If they want to look at, you know, uh, talking about some kind of online blogging or something, you know, to explore in that, uh, in that space, you know, that could be something that they could be interested in as well. Or, you know, they, they, you know, they could have interesting discussions about why they wouldn't want to have their information out publicly online as well. Um, because I've taught online for a long time, and 
I've had plenty of students that have come to me that said, you know, just so you know, this person by this name is me. I'm just going by another name because I have a restraining order against a former husband or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, really serious stuff. And so, you know, and so I totally understand that and, and let them know, sure, great. You know, if, you know, if you, if you need to get offline for some reason, for safety, whatever you need to do, I'm fine with that. We'll adjust. I think that that also goes to the instructor and the design side of that flexibility piece of realizing that not all of your students are in the same place, not all of your students feel uh, the same amount of safety in online spaces as you may feel. And so you have to uh, go back to that bigger topic we're talking about, of, uh, that flexibility and have that conversation with your students rather than just telling them what to do. All right. Bonnie, you had something you wanted to add? Yeah, just one of my goals when I'm particularly teaching a course that's fully online is ultimately if we have synchronous sessions built in, and I usually only put in a few over in a whole term and they're semi-optional, but my goal is ultimately that if people want to join those that they may even be game to contribute, but I definitely don't expect that at the beginning. And I'm doing all kinds of different things to try to build to that. So including starting with the anonymous things like Mentimeter polls and live slides. So they're getting a sense that I'm here with people and there's like they they start to be able to read the room and feel hopefully safer in the room. Then I might move to stuff like the LMS um, where they might be engaging in discussion boards with each other, but that is kind of captured under the institutional visibility piece. And then sometimes we'll move to blogging um, and doing public work because my students are gonna be teachers and so I wanna encourage them to at least understanding what it is to do open practice and then making clear that they also have the right to use a pseudonym and be, be graded under that pseudonym as long as I know what it is while they're putting that out. But um, one of the things that I do as well is it's important in my class for them to always see each other's work, except there is one piece and it's a, um, they redesign a syllabus kind of at the end of the course they just email that to me. It isn't visible to anyone except me. And so I'm using different types of visibility and to whom and what kind of trace those things leave um, across the course and talking about it so that again, they're building digital literacy um, in thinking about the internet as something that can be engaged with in different ways. But you can, you could like, I years and years ago, 2002, I taught a totally online course totally through email. I'm sure it was terrible but it can be relatively one-to-one -one if that's all you know. That does sound terrible. I apologize to those students. <laughs> Daniel, do you want to get in there? Um, yeah, just the, I, I think um, I'm thinking right now about the Digital Pedagogy Lab this summer. We're designing our courses. It's a, it's a week-long event. I don't want to talk too much about it because it's a lot of inside baseball and all that, but um, uh, as I'm designing with my um, co-facilitator, uh, Francesca Sobond in, over in the UK, um, yeah, we're talking a lot about what our, our, our thing, it's a creative, no, no, critical visual dialogues is the name of the track. And um, a large piece of it is social media. So if you're going to be in that track, you have to be engaging in those places. And I know there's a lot of issues and challenges for, uh, you know, all different kinds of people, um, but they basically have to have at least an anonymous or pseudonym or something like that. And a lot of the work is going to be being in public and having visual dialogues with people, hopefully mostly just with visuals. Um, so I'm just, I, my head right now is in that space where I'm thinking about we're going to have synchronous events, but that's the other thing about BPL is Digital Pedagogy Lab. Um, it is not, um, um, they are not necessary, like the synchronous events aren't necessary. So we're going to have these like kind of drop in places. It's going to be very, uh, interesting because usually exactly like in a class you don't usually like when, when we went when we went remote it was mandatory for a while for people to have synchronous everything and people were and it was just we, we you know we we did what we had to do and whatever and then slowly the you know things just started coming apart and people were like well you know one of my students literally has no internet at home and can't be and is in you know some place that has no access at all and they're eight hours ahead as well and you know there's just all of these issues um, so I, I think trying to design for, um, especially for online pieces, uh, asynchronous and synchronous mix of things. And then, yeah, wh what does it matter if things go away? I used to be so like a digital hoarder and be like, everything I make anywhere, I have to make sure like, can you send me the link to the deck that I'll probably never look at again? <laughs> you know, or I'll randomly find searching for something else nine years later. So I don't know, these artifacts or these pieces that we all leave, um, in our digital classrooms and in our digital spaces, it's 
it's really fascinating. And some of them that links go away, videos move places, like all these things change. And I still don't really know what, what kind of effect that has on learners. Um, Cause I've been doing a lot of this work uh, as a digital, well, whatever, online learner for a long, long time now. And I don't even know how I feel about it. Sometimes I really was like, I wish I had that paper from blog, but I know I'm, I'm ranting now. Dave, where's the hook? It's 401. The time is right there. You were just about to get it. Bonnie, can you wraps up, please? Thank you very much, Sandy, Matt, Daniel, for joining us. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating in these over the last five weeks. And to all of our folks who've been here as co-hosts, as participants, um, it's been really helpful and meaningful for me just to kind of connect across some of the boxes that we all live in, um, in education. I think we are all doing a shared job at this point and we are all on a shared learning curve right and we may be at different places on it but it's benef beneficial to talk to each other and um, so I hope to see you all out there in the ether and good luck with everything you're doing and again thank you bye everybody